Ho, oh, it's Scott Manley here. When we last left our intrepid astronauts, they had tried to fit four astronauts into a three astronaut pod. And as you know, that would not go. So after refueling, it is decided that we're going to try and take our astronaut Wildorf up to his original capsule, Kerpolo, which is in a 200 kilometer orbit above the moon. We are currently in a seven kilometer orbit above the moon, so it is time to perform what is known as a Hovman transfer orbit. Now, it's pretty easy to do the math on this. What we're going to do is we're going to go into an orbit where one, uh, where the periaps is seven kilometers above the surface, and the apoapse is 200 kilometers above the surface. So that's a 207 by 400 kilometer orbit. Now, it's very easy to do the mathematics on this, and you figure out that to boost up into the initial orbit, you're going to have to burn with about 82, 83 meters per second. And at the other end, you're going to have to boost your velocity again by about 70 meters per second. So given that we have about 500 meters per second delta V budget in this suit, that is well within what we're able to do. Now, the other thing to calculate is when to burn. Now, if you know the rules for, for orbit periods, orbital periods the goes as the square of the semi or sorry the cube of the semi-major axis, which is essentially the radius for circular orbits, uh, taking the square root of that. So you take the take the orbital radius, cube it, and then take the square root of that, and that gives you the relative periods. Now the average radius of a an eccentric orbit with one node at 207 and the other at 400 is roughly 303.5. Um, so that makes its magic number around 5,200 uh, and something. Whereas the um, Kerpolo is up in a 400 kilometer orbit. So it, its magic number is like 8,000. So you divide one by the other and then multiply that by 180. And that tells me that if, if I um, burn when the separation of the nodes is 118 degrees, then I should land very close when I get into orbit. So this is how you calculate the time. Now, we're talking about 118 degrees away from the opposite node, right, which... If we take away 100, if we take that away from 180, that gets us to about 62 degrees. So I want these two craft, I want their orbital positions to differ by about 62 degrees. And I'm going to completely eyeball this. I don't have any instruments or anything. I'm not going to hold a protractor up to the screen while I try to calculate this. But, you know, given that it's going to be, you know, two thirds, one third, I, I think I can probably get pretty close to 62 degrees, but we shall find out. So, um, yeah, getting pretty close. Uh, it's also hard. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go there. So now here he is, sitting out, floating by himself. I need to figure out which way I'm going now. So, yeah. Oh, and wow. what? How fortuitous is that? Turns out that the planet Kerbin is rising across the lunar surface literally as I come in here. So uh, you can see the, the way the orbit curves here, the, what, the position of Kerbin. So that is going to be the best thing for me to aim for. Just line myself up with that now. And we have small amount of fuel there, 95%. And I'm just burning. As I said, we only need about 82, 83 meters per second. Uh, so this is a small part of the fuel supply, not a huge problem. And there we go. You see how easily this is going up. You can watch the velocity of Wildorf rise. And yep, there we go. As Well, it's about 90 meters per second, I think I gained. So I get pretty close with my estimate. Um, so there we are. And the outer node, well, it looks like I'm a little, a little inclined, but I can correct that once I get up there. We don't want to do inclination corrections when we're close to the planet and moving fast. We want to do the inclination correction corrections when we are moving as slowly as possible. So now it is time to kick in the time acceleration and bring myself all the way around to this target orbit. But I want to be careful. I don't want to miss this this node. Um, yeah, there we are coming around the dark side. Definitely inclined, but again, not a problem. We have a full-on RCS system. 
and watch how these things line up. So now it looks like I'm going a little faster early on, but what'll happen is once I get halfway out, I will start running uh, slower and the other vehicle will start to catch up on me. And watch this. I mean, so, so I mean, it's all about calculating these angles. You basically figure out the ratio of the periods and multiply that by 180. And that gives you the, gives you the angular deviation between the, the two nodes. Because in the time that it takes you to go 180 degrees, he's going to go part of it. He's going to go a little less. Okay, so we're pretty darn close. Um, we'll have to do some more corrections, but that's not a problem. Okay, so turn around. Now using the nebula as my reference point here. And so I want to accelerate. I guess I'm a little low here. That might not be bad. So I'm in a lower orbit right now, which is not ideal because really I want to be in a higher orbit so that he naturally catches up with me. But just uh, thrusting along the prearranged vector that I figured out, thrusting towards that nebula, and there we go. We're in a circular orbit, and again, we've only burned about... We burned less than 200 meters per second, so we should have still have more than half a tank of EVA fuel, probably about 60% of a tank maybe even, to uh, complete the final rendezvous. And we're pretty close in space. And I don't know if I can do that. It says, well, look, we have a mission clock here. So the mission clock is 51 minutes. It will be awesome if I can do this in the magic four hour number. I do not want to waste fuel on the other vehicle because it was built with such tight budget constraints that it may not even have the fuel to get home were it to start finagling around in orbit trying to pick up astronauts that were stranded there because of those stupid budgetary constraints. There we go. So now, oh, look at that. Silhouetted against the Earth. Fair distance out. So now I'm going to start wasting fuel and thrusting towards it. And this is going to be a whole bunch of maneuvering to uh, get myself within range. And this is going to take a whole lot of time. So let's hit the time accelerate button. So yes, yeah, 66% of fuel left. That's good. I have two thirds of my tank to complete this rendezvous. So uh, that's about 300 meters per second easily. Now, 300 meters per second doesn't sound like a lot, but the shuttle, the, the, uh, the man maneuvering units that were flown aboard the shuttle, they used compressed nitrogen for their fuel supply. And a completely fueled manned maneuvering unit had a, a total delta V capability of 24 meters per second. That means that the the ones that uh, the Kerbals have are approximately 20 or 22 times better than what the shuttle astronauts flew with. The the manned maneuvering units didn't get much use in the, the shuttle. After about STS-50, one I think was the last time they flew it. They, they were used to like pluck satellites and stuff from space, but ultimately NASA realized that they were kind of a liability. They weighed several hundred pounds to take into orbit, and everything they did you could practically do with the robot arm. So the, the astronauts don't have any onboard maneuverability capability anymore. So they don't have anything like this on the, the space station. It's all done with the robotic arm. See, as you see, I'm adjusting uh, velocities to catch up. I'm changing my orbit. There I am getting to within a few hundred meters, but uh, need to do some more adjusting. Time goes real. It's really hard to commentate on this in full, uh, full speed, but honestly, you don't want to watch the whole thing because it's vastly boring. Yeah, the original, um, originally in 1966, the Air Force developed uh, what's called an astronaut maneuvering unit for the Gemini program, but the the one flight that it flew on the the astronaut ended up so tired and overheated that his uh, visor fogged up and they had to abandon the test and then it was never flown in any other mission since then so um there hasn't been a great history of rocket packs so now we're getting we're down to like 30 percent of fuel we used two-thirds for fuel practically the same amount of fuel we used getting up here we used getting to within one kilometer and uh, yeah, I could have been far more patient, but you know that oxygen is running down. We're down to we're up to one hour and fifteen minutes of uh, mission elapsed time, and we are now approaching. We're definitely within visual range. You can see things uh, quite clearly now, to within a hundred, couple of hundred meters, and the 
the queue has now disappeared. We're just going to come in here very carefully. And once we get in close, we want to slow down so we don't smash into it. That would be rather embarrassing again. I guess it's upside down, pointing towards the, the, the moon. Obviously, so the pilots can have a great view. Boy, wouldn't they be surprised if when he turns up, huh? So yeah, just getting around. Now looking for where the ladder and hatch are. Uh, it looks like they're on the other side again. That just seems to keep on happening every time I come up for these missions. The, the hatch and ladder always end up on the other side of the spacecraft from me. There we go. Come on in. Just no need to rush this. We have another two hours and 40 minutes of endurance of, of air. So come in, last few feet. It's just beautiful. He's going to come in upside down, of course, but that's not a problem. And so now climb down, get in, and the crew is back together again. Unfortunately, it's a crew of second-rate astronauts that we're not caring about. Jeb still is not a taking the stand on the, the trial regarding this whole rocket thing. I'm sure the administrators will eventually see their way after the disaster of this mission. So let's get ourselves round to a, a res return position. That's us. Okay, about 45 degrees is a good one. So now line up for our uh, return burn. Because we can just take these astronauts home now. It has been an epic quest, but, you know, the astronauts have performed, Wildorf has performed admirably under the circumstances. Even though he crashed the spaceship, no doubt those administrators will try to peg the disaster on him. But we all know it's because they're cutting money from the program to pay for their giant houses and swimming pools. Scumbags. And there we go. Uh, almost, uh, oh wait, two, 24 kilometers. Yeah, let's just get a little closer because we'd be embarrassing to skip off. And again, another thing the administrators would use to take money from the program that rightfully goes to our heroes. There, and look, we get a little bit of fuel left. Uh, definitely, I don't know if we could have rescued the astronaut with that fuel. It is really good that we have this amount standing by. Actually... I can pretty much say we would not have been able to rescue the astronaut with that amount of fuel because we need to we'd need a couple of hundred meters per second just to bring ourselves down to the transfer orbit and then that wouldn't leave any time for maneuvering. But it will be a textbook return otherwise. Well that's enough for me. This has been an epic mission. See you around sometime. Fly safe.